And that can be found on page 4, I think. Anyway, it's Genesis 14. Uh, begin to read at verse 1. Genesis 14 and reading from verse 1. At the time when Amraphel was king of Shinar, Arioch king of Elasa, Kedorlaomer king of Elam, and Tidal king of Goyim, these kings went to war against Birar king of Sodom, Bersha king of Gomorrah, Shanab king of Adma, Shimabah king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor. All these latter kings joined forces in the valley of Sidon, that is the Dead Sea Valley. For twelve years they had been subject to Kedelioma, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Kedelioma and the kings allied with him went out and defeated the Raphaites in Ashtaroth, Karnaim, the Zuzites in Ham, the Emites in Sheva, Karethim, and the Horites in the hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran, near the desert. Then they turned back and went to En Mishpah, that is Kadesh, and they conquered the whole territory of the Malachites, as well as the Amorites who were living in Azazon, Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, the king of Zaboyim, and the king of Bela, that is Zorah, marched out and drew up their battle lines in the valley of Sidon against Kedeleoma, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goyim, Amraphel, king of Shina, and Arioch, king of Elasa. Four kings against five. Now the valley of Sidon was full of tar pits, and when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some of the men fell into them, and the rest fled to the hills. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their food, then they went away. They also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions, since he was living in Sodom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading follows on from the first, Genesis 14, verses 13 to 24, which can be found on page 15 of the Church Bibles. A man who had escaped came and reported this to Abram the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Anna, all of whom were allied with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobar, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and the other people. After Abram returned from defeating Kedorlaomer and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, With raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord, God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten, and the share that belongs to the men who went with me, to Anna, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them have their share. This is the word of the Lord. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do pray that your Holy Spirit, who inspired your scriptures to be written, would also inscribe those words into each one of our hearts. Lord, as we turn to this episode, which took place thousands of years ago in a, an obscure part of the world, yet, Lord, we know it's a word for us today here in Hull. And so, Lord God, we pray that you would do that wonderful miracle in each one of our hearts tonight, for your dear name's sake. Amen. Amen. Please do be seated.
Now, let me tell you the story of Levi Hefner, who was a Confederate courier during the uh, American Civil War. And one night, he was sent by his commanding officer, General Robert E. Lee, to take a message through an area which was partially occupied by Union troops. And as he approached a bridge, his horse balked and reared nervously. And so Efner dismounted, and he attempted to calm him in the darkness by singing very gently an old familiar hymn, Jesus, Lover of My Soul. Well, within a few moments, the horse became quiet. Hefner remounted the horse, crossed the bridge without any further incident, and completed his mission. Well, a number of years after the war, Hefner attended a reunion of soldiers from both sides of the conflict. And as they gathered together in small groups to share their experiences they remembered from the war, one Union soldier from Ohio recounted standing guard one night at a bridge. And he'd been given a specific order to shoot anyone approaching from the other side. He said during the night, one rider came by. So he raised his rifle, took a bead on the, driver, way on the rider, waiting for the shape to uh, appear in the darkness. And just then he said the horse balked and the rider dismounted. And to calm the horse, the rider began singing very softly, Jesus, love of my soul. And the Union soldier told the other old soldiers around him that that hymn so touched him that he lowered his rifle and quietly turned away. He said, I could not shoot him. Well, Levi Hefner jumped up and embraced the Union soldier and said, that was me! He realized for the very first time that singing that hymn, that dark night, had saved his life. Or from a different standpoint, God had saved it. Now, what is the moral of that? Well, it is this, that in the midst of the big affairs of world history, God is still at work in the special affairs of his people. While the world may have its eye fixed upon what they think is the uh, major movers and players, the major events, God's eye is firmly fixed on his people and his purpose. Namely, the salvation of those who put their trust in the seed of Abraham. That is, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, all of that, I think, is perfectly illustrated in the passage we're looking at together this evening in Genesis 14. Now, the first thing we see is that we have the care of God's servant, verses 1 to 16. Now, I guess you can think of this as a very, 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 very hard Brexit. You know, forget the negotiations. According to the famous five of Canaan, they were out of union which had been imposed upon them by Kedolioma for 12 years, and so they decide to form a new alliance. Now, the news that the kings had failed to offer their customary tribute was not very well received by Kedolioma, who lived in what is now modern-day Iran. And so he sets off with his own alliance of three other kings, and he makes this massive trek towards Sodom, and her sister towns located on the southern end of the Dead Sea. Now, the gang probably came down the Transjordan Highway through the area east of the Jordan, taking out three opposing groups in verse 5. Then past the Dead Sea to Seir, defeating the Horites in verse 6. Then turning northwest to knock the stuffing out of the Amalekites in Kadesh, verse 7 before turning east and northeast to Hazazon Tamer, taking out the Amorites. And that's when they move in for the kill against Sodom and her allies. Now, in English terms, this is like uh, the uh, Cedo Leoma coming to England and Oxford, where the uh, four kings were located. So he would come down from Northampton, to Reading, uh, and then he'd go on to Southampton, 
Then he would turn northwest to Bath, then to Swindon, and then finally to Oxford. So you can see that on the map. That's what it'd be like. Massive trek, okay? Now you say, well, why not go straight to the original rebels? Well, who knows? Maybe it was to ensure the neutralization of any potential supporters that might come to Sodom's aid. But also, of course, it demonstrates the superior strength of the uh, kings coming in. And so it's a, a kind of sort of psychops. It weakens Sodom's and Co.'s resolve when the news eventually reaches them of each successive triumph of these armies that were making their way slowly but surely towards them. Well, it seemed to have worked. Because as verses 10 to 12 describe what was essentially a rout of the five kings as they make a run for it, possibly falling into tar pits, or maybe using those tar pits as hideouts, because the verb here, fell, can mean to let themselves down. Now, whatever, it was a rather ignominious end to their rather foolish political gamble. Now, if that were all that had happened, this event would have disappeared without a trace. It would not have deserved a footnote in the annals of ancient Near Eastern history. So what made the difference so that this story has been read again and again and again by millions of people throughout the world over thousands of years? The answer is that the triumphant kings are taking with them someone called Lot. Now, it was, an, it was a name which didn't mean that much to them, but it meant an awful lot, pardon the pun, to God. Because this was the nephew of God's man, Abraham. So you touch him and his kin, no matter who you are, then you touch the apple of God's eye. And so we have an interesting take on the way the Bible sees history. For the BBC, that is the Babylonian Broadcasting Company, the big shots were the Fab Four under the leadership of Kedel Leoma. They were the ones who were sent to stage. But not according to the biblical text. Rather, it is this Hebrew, verse 13, which probably carries a negative connotation that he's a foreigner. He doesn't belong. He doesn't fit. And yet, it is Abraham with his band of merry men in verse 14 who actually win the day. They do so by engaging in a night raid and they split their forces, covering first 111 miles and then pursuing the enemy a further 62 miles to make sure they don't come back. And the victory is really quite astonishing, because having recovered everything and everyone. Now this is vintage Yahweh, if I can put it like that. As we shall see in a moment, there's no doubt whose great hand is behind the victory. And that what matters to him is keeping his promises to his people, ensuring that nothing, absolutely nothing, gets in the way of him bringing about his saving purposes for the world. God had said he would bless Abraham, and that he would be a source of blessing. Well, here we have one wonderful instance of that taking place. And that is the main thing, that God will weave all events, great and small, to that one great end. As one commentator puts it, you have world history and you have significant history, the latter being embedded in the former, like a, a series of pictures in a complex tapestry which make up the main theme of the tapestry. 
And so, while Caesar Augustus decides to call the census for tax purposes, God superintends that decision with a purpose of his own, namely to bring a young couple to their hometown in Bethlehem in order to fulfill his promise to his people that the Messiah would be born in the city of David, Luke chapter 2. Do you see how it works? And so if you are a Christian here tonight, then you are to cherish the knowledge that you are part of God's significant history. And he will superintend world history and do whatever it takes for the express purpose of getting you home to glory. Just as he ensured that Abraham would inherit his promise of having a place and a people. Now that is the measure of how important you are to God. And it's also a measure of how powerful God really is. You see, the true king at work in and through these events is not Kedelioma. It is Yahweh. And so we turn to the choice of God's servant, verses 17 to 24. Now, on his return, Abraham comes into contact with two contrasting kings, the king of Sodom and the king of Salem, probably Jerusalem. Now, presumably, having cleaned himself up, the king of Sodom comes out of hiding. And, and you can almost detect the sense of self-importance as he approaches Abraham in verse 17, only to be cut off by the king of Salem in verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. But Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Now, in these two kings, we find two different attitudes towards Abraham and a very important choice made by Abraham. Melchizedek is a priest king. His name means king of righteousness. That is, he's a king who will do what is right. He's also the king of Salem, which means peace, you know, shalom. And what is more, he is the priest of the God Most High, which some take to mean that here, in the midst of all the moral cesspit of Canaan, as exemplified by Sodom and Gomorrah, there are still worshippers of the one true God. And here's the chief of them. And all of these things are brought together as he meets Abraham. He acts righteously, asking nothing from Abraham, but giving something to Abraham, bread and wine. Now this may be more than giving of physical sustenance. It's a token of fellowship, approval, and then he pronounces a blessing on Abraham and God. For he, you see, knows how to read history properly. That this victory has been given by God Most High. It wasn't chance. It wasn't fate. And neither was it all down to Abraham's military prowess. And Abraham sees this as God's man. And so in an act of profound symbolism, he gives to Melchizedek, and so to God, a tenth of everything he has. You see, he knows who he is beholden to. And he does not begrudge the fact. And given that God has promised, back in chapter 12, that whoever blesses Abraham will also be blessed. That means that somehow Melchizedek is going to be in for one mighty blessing. But how was Melchizedek to be blessed? You see, after this episode, we don't hear of him again in the narrative. He disappears as quickly as he came on. 
But let's think for a moment of how we tend to bless or honor people in order to see how Melchizedek was blessed. You see, we name streets or ships after people who have made some major achievement. So we have Wellington Street or Churchill Avenue. Uh, Perhaps children are named after them. So John Lennon's middle name is John Winston, uh, Winston Lennon. And we erect statues and we hang portraits so that future generations can look upon them and maybe ask questions about them, who they were, what they did. And so in that sense, you see, you, you keep their memories alive. But what about this? Having your name linked to the eternal Son of God. So that God's own Son is said to be like you. That's what happened to Melchizedek. This person, who more or less has a walk on part in Scripture, is because of his attitude towards Abraham given such an honor that his name is forever associated with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that beats all your street naming and statue erecting, doesn't it? In Psalm 104, Melchizedek is specifically linked to King David. And an oath is made by God that you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So his memory, you see, is venerated in Jerusalem. He's the forerunner of King David. But the writer to the Hebrews takes it even further. Because he presents him as a type of Jesus saying that Jesus is a high priest like him. He's a king priest who bestows blessing upon all of Abraham's spiritual children. He lives forever to intercede for them. So just as Melchizedek blessed Abraham, Jesus forever blesses us. Do you see? But what a contrast with the king of Sodom whose name is proverbially associated with greed and perversion. Whereas Melchizedek blesses Abraham, Sodom disdains him with his grasping demand. Give me the persons, take possessions for yourself. Not even a thank you, no courtesy. It seems the king is, is trying to bring Abraham under his sway. Whereas Melchizedek saw Abraham under God's sway. The offer to, for Abraham to keep the possessions could be seen as an attempt to curry favor with Abraham, drawing him into Sodom's sphere of influence. So he owes him one. Now it's assumed that this is the way you operate a demand here, a gift there. However, Abraham will have none of it. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, With raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread, not even a strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abraham rich. Now, maybe Abraham had already anticipated such a move, which is why he had made a resolution beforehand to accept absolutely nothing. So he would be beholden to no one except God. But can you see that had Abraham not prepared beforehand, that he could have succumbed to that kind of offer? After all, he'd made such a catch. He was now somebody important. So important that the king approaches him with the deal. He's a somebody now. What better way of getting rid of that derogatory epithet Hebrew but by aligning yourself with the natives? 
Perhaps this was God's way of blessing him, ensuring that he got a foothold in the land of Canaan that God had promised him. It sounds so reasonable, doesn't it? But of course, as we heard last week, it seemed oh so reasonable for Lot to go into the land of Sodom in the first place. Look what happened to him. What may seem reasonable is not always wise, and especially if it is the way of compromise and accommodation to the point that your faith is ruined. You know, in many ways, the king of Sodom represents the world with all its enticements and condescending attitude towards God's people. Oh, sure, there may be an air of flattery, but underneath there is contempt, and the end game is always the same, to get God's man to become the world's man, Sodom's puppet. And the same is true today. Enticements will be made to get the believer to make a little compromise here, a bit of accommodation there, until bit by bit the faith which was once vibrant and bright becomes lifeless and dim. It's called seduction. Now let me tell you there are four stages by which we get seduced by the king of Sodom. Stage one is assumption. When some idea in modern life is assumed to be worthwhile and superior to Christian belief. Second, there is abandonment. So whatever in the Christian faith doesn't fit in with a new assumption, it's either modified or it's jettisoned. This is followed by adaptation. Something new is assumed, something old is abandoned, everything else is adapted. So while it has a semblance of genuine Christianity, it is significantly modified until the final stage is reached, assimilation. So that what is left is absorbed by the modern world and effectively taken over. So what passes for Christianity is simply reflecting back to the world its own values and its own ideas in a thinly veiled Christian dress. Oh, sure, Christian words may be used, but the Christian content has been removed. The guts have been taken out of it. Now, our youngest son, Philip, is an assistant minister at a church in London, which has many young professionals going there, many students. And he says they are so confused over the issue of sexuality, which is not surprising. Because perhaps here we see this Sodom process being worked out most effectively today. It is assumed that our identity is bound up with our sexuality, which we can define and express as we will. Then some sectors of the church abandon the Bible's teaching that our real identity is found in relation to Christ. That our sexuality is a God-given gift, expressed in terms of male and female, but nonetheless, which has been corrupted by sin. Then there's adaptation. So as far back as 1993, we read this in one Anglican Evangelical theological journal. We ought to accept homosexual relationships that are not idolatrous as being part of God's variety in creation. Those who are convinced and gone that this is the form of life that they are called to ought to be respected, whether they're lay or ordained. And now we have assimilation. So that the views of the world are either forced upon the church or happily embraced by the church, as they express, for example, in same-sex marriage or uh, homosexual blessing. But the fact is, we all have to be aware of the choices we have to make between seeking the blessing of Melchizedek, Christ, or coming under the pull of Sodom, the world. 
And the choices we make in the little things and having the resolve early on will determine the choices we'll, we'll, we will make later on in the big things. Now, let me say, especially to those of you here tonight who are younger, that you need to resolve before God in your heart that you will seek to be true to Him, that you will give your all to Him, as Abraham did, and seek the blessings of your king, priest, Jesus, at whatever the cost. Now, why not make that resolve tonight before you leave here? Because if you do, you will find tremendous liberty and you will gain everlasting blessing. And those of us who are older, what are we going to do? Are we going to set an example to the younger people by showing that we are all out for Christ? Or are we going to keep our heads down, collect our pensions and hopefully drift into heaven? Because that would be a shameful thing to do. Now, in the words of the writer to the Hebrews, as he ponders the example of Abraham and others, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for the truth that all Scripture is written for our learning. And we pray, dear Lord, that you would so impress upon us this evening the lessons of this passage. We know from our own experience of how easy it is to be lured by the King of Sodom. But we thank you because of your revelation that we have a great high priest like Melchizedek, even Jesus Christ. May he capture our hearts, our imaginations, our gratitude. And Lord, both individually and collectively as a church, we pray, dear Lord, we would look to him and follow him in all things for your name's sake. Amen.